turn with me to Numbers chapter 11. I'm going to begin with this text and look at several passages out of the Psalms, which um, certainly reflect aspects of giving thanks or gratitude to God. <clears throat> First Numbers 11, verses 4 through 6. This is when the people were in the wilderness after the deliverance from Egypt. After God had sent the ten plagues on Egypt, delivered them, enabled them to cross the Red Sea, destroyed the Egyptian army, provided for them with manna in the desert, the wilderness, and remember their clothes did not even wear out during the wanderings. And here's their response. <laughs> Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. You can almost hear the disdain in their voice. He goes on to describe it. This is a time when, in verse 10, Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of this tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth? That you should come and say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land you swore to give your fathers. Where am I to get meat to give all these people? So they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I'm not able to carry all this people alone for the burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find faith in your sight that I may not see my wretchedness. I uh, remember hearing one sermon years ago that said when Moses prays that, there's a pastoral prayer. God, God, God please kill me. After <laughs> some of the things that go on. And uh, let's pray together. Father, we see the response of the people of Israel after you had done so much to them. And we look at them and think, how could they possibly be that way? And yet, we see similar attitudes in our own hearts that we so easily forget your abundant mercy day by day and forget all that you had done for us. And we complain and we murmur about the things in our life that we don't like and forget and tremendous blessings that you have poured into our lives. We ask you to forgive us of those attitudes and work in us a deep awareness, a deep consciousness of how much you had truly done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Children have a way of embarrassing their parents. <laughs> Every now and then the halo slips and basic human nature shines through. Uh, an aunt gives a little boy a piece of candy and the mother calls on Joey and says, say thank you Joey. And he stands there frowning. <laughs> and you know, he's probably we've all experienced something like that. Maybe ourselves doesn't come naturally to us, and certainly children have to be taught to express gratitude. Uh, showing gratitude to adults doesn't come easily. And especially when we think about relationship to God. It's so easy to get excited at the moment we receive something, and then Three, four days later, we forget all about it. Or our next problem comes along, and that's overwhelming, and we don't think about all that God has done for us before. We focus on some discomfort of the moment and express the opposite of gratitude to God. 
Well, I want us to look at several passages this morning, as I mentioned, starting with this one in Numbers 11, and look at some of the purpose of expressing gratitude to God. In Numbers 11, of course, the people had been delivered from Egypt. They had seen a miraculous deliverance as God essentially destroyed the Egyptian Empire, destroyed every aspect of their economy, brought to shame all the gods they worshipped. Those plagues, most of them were against their gods and the things they worshipped. They even worshipped the gnats and the flies and all those things. And of course, Pharaoh's even his son dies. And then he destroys a huge Egyptian army pursuing them. They cross the Red Sea with a miraculous deliverance. And here is their attitude. And we see this all through these chapters in Numbers, all the different times they murmur and complain. But notice, particularly in verses 4 and 5, Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. Huh. Cost nothing. They were slaves in Egypt. <laughs> the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Many of them probably still had scars on their backs from the slave master's whip. They forgot that. We just want what we want now. And of course in this Moses prays. He's perplexed and he just says, God, you know, just take my life. I can't stand it anymore. Well, God's response to him is to first give him help. He gathers the 70 men of Israel to be elders to assist him and help him carry the burden. And then God says, I'm going to give them meat to eat. And if you look down at verse 18 and following, and say to the people, Consecrate yourselves to the morrow, uh, for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall not eat just one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils, and becomes loathsome to you, because you rejected the Lord who is among you, and hath wept before Him, saying, Why did we come out of Egypt? He says, I'll give you meat to eat until it runs out of your nose. Now, that Moses, you know, is a man of faith. He's trusted God all through these things. This is some one point where he's just a little bit taken aback. And he says in verse 22, um, Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered from them, and be enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together to them, and be enough for them? And the Lord said to Moses, Is the Lord's hand shortened? I like the old translation, Is the Lord of the... Was the arm of the Lord grown short? Now you shall see whether my word will come true or not. Well, Rob brings quail in, and they surround the camp and just up, you know, up to their waist basically. And they begin to eat it, and God's judgment falls upon them. And he begins to strike the people with a great plague. Well, it's a, in a way, a very sad story. But it's a very common story to mankind. Uh, of course, this people had seen more of the miracles of God than most people ever see. And they were experiencing them right then. And they forgot those things. It's so easy for us to forget. God's blessings in the past when we're experiencing a problem in the present and focus only on the moment. Our memories become selective. The people of Israel remembered the food they ate in Egypt, but they forgot the slave master's whip. They forgot the execution of their male babies. 
the grueling work as slaves. When God provided for them in the wilderness, they began to despise His provision. We don't like manna. We've had it other which way we can cook it. And one of the reasons the Bible commands us to express gratitude to God is that it forces us to focus and analyze on what God has done for us. Now some of the Psalms touch on this. For example, in Psalm 103 verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Notice the psalm includes an exhortation not to forget what God has done for us. Psalm 106 verse 13, they quickly forgot His works. They did not wait for His counsel, but craved intensely in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Well, we're just like the people of Israel. When we're facing adversity, our natural tendency is to forget all the things God has done for us. All the experiences that we've gone through where God has brought us to this point. It's easy to focus on that present moment, that crisis, and forget God's faithfulness to us all through our lives. Have you ever been so focused on a certain set of problems that you become blind to the myriad of blessings God has poured into your life? <coughs> Building a habit of expressing gratitude guards against those attitudes, making it a part of our regular life, our regular prayers. Think about what God has done for you. God Himself, God the Son, took human flesh, died upon a cross, bore the wrath of God against you. Now that you're in Christ, you know that's true. You were in a place in your life where you heard the gospel. Think about it, you were even born into a place where the gospel was preached. Some of us were born to Christian parents and grew up hearing the gospel. Others heard it later in our lives. God essentially providentially set that in place for you. And then the Holy Spirit opens your heart to believe the gospel and bring you to Jesus. You were naturally dead in sin and your trespasses. And God being rich in mercy because of this great love of which He loved you made you alive in Christ Jesus. One morning at the breakfast table, a father was asking the blessing, as usual, praying. And he quoted Bible verses and piously thanked God for all the bountiful provisions that he gave. After the prayer, he began to eat his breakfast and then complained loudly about the poor quality of the food. He berated his wife for the way the bacon was cooked and it was disgruntled with everything. And his little daughter said, Dad, he said, uh, do you think God heard you when you prayed? <laughs> he said, certainly He heard me. <laughs> he said, did He also hear you when you complained about the bacon and coffee just now? <laughs> so, well, He did. Then which one did God believe? <laughs> well, there's, of course, captures our attitude so often. When good comes His way, we can't explain it in terms of nat our way and natural causes. Remember the book that was written, what was it, in the 80s, maybe late 70s, when bad things happened to good people, Rabbi Kushner? Horrible book. And uh, I remember thinking it was supposed to give people hope, and his answer was basically God's not omnipotent, and He's doing the best He can, but give the poor old guy a break. And that's supposed to give you hope. <laughs> that's a bestseller, sadly. But um, you think about it, the only time a bad thing ever happened to a good person was Jesus on the cross. All of us, uh, we think about our sin, sinfulness and the way we sin daily before God, and He still forgives us, gives us grace and mercy daily over and over and over, based on the work of Jesus. 
For expressing gratitude to God cultivates that attitude in us, and it also exalts God. Again, there are many scriptures which address this. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, so this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Psalm 30, verse 1, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up, and have not let my foes rejoice over me. We might not be in a military battle, but there are many foes in our life that God has taken care of for us. In Psalm 34, verses 1 and 2, I will bless the Lord of all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord, but the humble hear and be glad. The various psalmists seek to make God's goodness evident in their words. One purpose for expressing gratitude is the exaltation of God in the words that we speak in our prayers, sing in our hymns and songs. It also guards our hearts against our own forgetfulness. It's important to build that regular giving of thanks into our prayer life. The well-known Bible commentator Matthew Henry made the following entry in a diary after he had been robbed. He said, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my wallet, they did not take my wife. And third, because although they took my all, it was not much. <laughs> and fourth, because it was, was I who was robbed and not I who was doing the robbing. He was thankful in a situation created by evil in his life, but saw the, the work and mercy of God in it. When I read that response, I was reminded of 1981 when I lived in San Antonio and I woke up in the middle of the night with the sound of my bedroom. And I kind of raised up in my bed and the guy was in my door frame, kind of silhouetted in the light and said, like this, don't move, I got a gun, one move and it'll blow your head off. Uh, so I didn't move. <laughs> and, uh, and he took my little, he, I guess he'd already carried it out at that point, little portable TV I had. And uh, it was the night before the Super Bowl so I guess he was out shopping for a new TV to watch the Super Bowl on the next day. But uh, I called my parents the next day and told them what had happened. My dad said, well, a TV can be replaced. That's not a big deal. We're just thankful you weren't hurt. And I thought that was interesting. That was his immediate response to it. Well, what are some of the ways we express gratitude in prayer? Uh, sometimes we say just thank you out of habit and really don't know any other way to say it. Um, the story is told of the young woman who said thank you a hundred times a day, even in inappropriate situations in her office. And somebody told her, said, you know, but please stop saying thank you. I can't stand it anymore. He said, you know, somebody you know, stumbles over you and you say thank you. And she said, oh, you're, you're right. I'm sorry. I, you know, I shouldn't do that anymore. Thank you. <laughs> you went, ah! <laughs> well, sometimes we express gratitude in the same unconscious way. Uh, God, we thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the day. Thank you for sending his son to die on the cross. Well, none of those phrases is inappropriate. But after a while, they can come easily to our lips and sometimes maybe automatically come to our lips without a depth of meaning to them in our thinking. How long can we simply say thank you without them becoming commonplace? Well, the Psalms give us a pattern for giving thanks to God. And I think it's, some of these give us guidelines for building this into our lives. The psalmist expressed their gratitude to God by giving detailed accounts of what God had done for them in their prayers. For example, in Psalm 105, the first five verses, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the peoples, 
sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually, remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and his judgments he uttered. <coughs> In Psalm 34, in verses 4 through 7, I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Apparently thinking about an event. Those who look to Him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and delivers them. In fact, sometime just read through Psalm 18. Forty-two verses are devoted to telling and retelling the story of God's actions in the person's life. Richard Pratt Jr. told the story of having a pastoral visit after a person got home from the hospital. And they would, you know, talk about their events that had taken place, and often he would ask them to lead a prayer at the end of the visit. This one man uh, just said a quick thank you and then gave the list of needs. Uh, bills, strength, continued healing, so on. In another pastoral visit, he talked to a lady who had undergone treatment for cancer. Now she was kind of on the back side of all that, doing well. And in her prayer, she basically prayed the story of her, those events back to God. As she prayed, she described the initial shock when she was diagnosed, and then comfort that she received from God in times of fear. She described kindness she'd received from, doc from doctors and nurses, opportunities she'd been given to share her faith in the midst of that, the joy of coming home, the thrill of the positive prognosis. She basically told her story back to God as a way of gratitude. And have you ever done that? Have you looked at events in your life that you've gone through that were difficult and God's brought you through them and you're on the back side of those things and then in prayer you go through and recount how God was with you each step of the way in those things. And he noted that she prayed without asking for a single thing. And really, every believer has a story to tell because God is always at work in our lives. We have recoveries from illnesses, resolution of family problems, deliverance from problems in the past. Uh, especially good to think about that if you're having trouble in the present. This weekend was one of those weekends for me especially. Uh, yesterday marked one year that I had the six hours of ankle surgery putting it all back together. And here I am, I'm standing here right now without any pain at all in my ankle. I'm walking up and down the aisle, it doesn't bother me. I'm re gradually regaining strength in that leg from not walking on it for about a year. And I thought about, you know, in this sermon, telling that story back to God. And one of the things I did, thinking about going through that process and God really caring for me and the support of people and the care I received. And God delights in hearing stories of thanksgiving. We see it in the Psalms. Obviously, it's in Scripture. We communicate gratitude by God and telling Him the details of what He has done for us. And those of you who had young children, maybe some of us that have grown children, think about those times that you might have given them a party or done something for them, and you're getting ready to put them to bed at night and they're thanking you for it, and you may ask them, what did you like best about the party? Or something like that, and they recount it to you. And you take joy in that. But what are some of the results that we have for cultivating this attitude of gratitude to God? 
Not only is God exalted as we express gratitude, but we are changed. We've already noted that it helps us not to forget His benefits, and it guards our hearts against grumbling against God. It can also be a source of encouragement. When troubles overwhelm us, it's a good time to give thanks to God. In the Psalms, the psalmists are strengthened as they thank God for things that He's done for them and is doing for them. For example, in Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent, O Lord my God. I will give thanks to you forever. Read of one missionary who was on a trip in Mexico and he, had, he got sick. He hadn't eaten for several days and he was feeling very low emotionally uh, besides the illness. And a friend insisted that he eat something. He said when he did, his, felt his body kind of started to come back to life and the discouragement and the fatigue vanished. Well, the same revitalization can come to us when we take time to tell God our stories of gratitude. You think about it, are you, do you feel tired in your spiritual life? Or discouraged with things going on in your life? Go back and think about what has God has done. There's an old hymn, you'll count your blessings, count them one by one, and you'll be amazed at what God has done. And sometimes the goodness of God might seem like only an empty theoretical concept to us. But as we start recounting all the things God has done for us, it becomes a reality. It also gives glory to God as we praise Him. Of course, the story is told of a Puritan who sat down for a daily meal. He only had a little bit of bread and some water. And as he looked at the modest there, he prayed, What all this in Jesus Christ too? Of course, he was understanding that no matter what I have in this life, I had the greatest gift of all that God could give through the salvation that comes in Jesus. R.C. Sproul made a good point concerning gratitude to God. He said, If God never did another thing for you outside of your salvation, your only reasonable and rational response will be to give Him constant thanksgiving and praise and service for the rest of your life. However, God does more than that. He gives us grace upon grace and mercy upon mercy. He supplies needs every day. He cares for us, delivers us, protects us. He restrains, He conquers His and our enemies, as the Shorter Catechism puts it. Christ's ministry is King, executing that office of King. And Sproul was right. You think about even salvation. God the Father sent His Son to accomplish salvation for us. The Son, God the Son incarnate, Jesus fulfilled all righteousness, died as a substitute for us on the cross. God the Holy Spirit applied that salvation to us. He's also at work keeping us, guiding us, sanctifying us in our Christian lives. And only Jesus met all the demands and needs necessary for our salvation. And that's why He is the only way of salvation. Remember Jesus' statement that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Me. Or Peter in Acts 4.12, there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. If you're not in Christ, you're still in your sins. You desperately need His forgiveness, His work of atonement applied to you. And the call and command of the Gospel is to throw yourself upon Jesus. If you are in Christ, think about what He's done for you. 
Sproul also said, Sin is cosmic treason against God. It is an act of supreme ingratitude toward the one, toward the one to whom we owe everything, to the one who has given us life itself. If you're not in Christ, you're in that state of sin before God. Don't neglect this great salvation. If you are in Christ, think about what God has done for you. All of us in our lives stand upon a mountain of sin that we have committed in our lives. We sin daily against God. And if we're in Christ, we experience His mercy and His grace daily. It's not an excuse to sin. But we certainly can see the mercy and grace and kindness of God given to us over and over and over. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for all that you had done for us. Each of us can think about so many things you had brought us through. So many things, some minor, some very large things. And here we are at this place in our life, in a setting where we're worshiping God, hearing His Word read and preached. And if we're in Christ, we can think about the mercy that was given to us in Jesus and your plan for us that extends to, back toward eternity and forward into eternity. And we are grateful for all that you had done, both in your kindness, kindness and providence and in our salvation. Help us to remember these things daily. In Jesus' name.